and uh, we have two talks this time. And uh, first up is a collaboration between people from Microsoft Research, Technion, and UT Austin on PTASK, which is an operating system abstract, which is a set of operating system abstractions that are going to help manage GPUs as compute devices. And here we have Chris Rosbach from Microsoft Research, who's going to tell us all about it. Can you all hear me? Is this working? Has it been tested? Great. All right, well, thank you for the introduction. I won't. Uh, do the conventional repeat of the uh, slide title since you already did that for me. But uh, you can hear it. Now you can hear it. The microphone actually follows me, so I can trivially stand next to it. Okay, so I'm here to present PTASK, which is an operating system abstractions to support GPUs as compute devices. This is joint work with my colleagues John Curry, Mark Silverstein, Baisak, Baishaki Ray, and Emmett Witchell. And, uh, Hopefully we won't have too much more feedback. So to motivate the talk, all right. I mean it this time. We're really starting the talk. So to motivate the talk, let me uh, make the rather simple observation that there are lots and lots of GPUs out there. Um, three of the top five supercomputers in the most recent top 500 list rely heavily on GPUs. And you can expect to see GPUs in almost all new PCs, smartphones, and tablet computers. Now, GPUs are really great for an obvious set of workloads that include gaming and certain scientific codes, but I maintain that they're almost unusable in a lot of other application domains. And I'm going to try to substantiate this claim a little later. Now, while we've come a long way toward making GPUs more programmable in, in the recent past, programming GPUs is still pretty difficult, and there's a long list of programming challenges associated with them. However, this is a short list because these are the two programming challenges that are going to feature prominently in this talk. First, GPUs typically have private memory, which is disjoint from the, memory in your, uh, the main memory in your computer. It's not accessible by a CPU. And second, to first order, GPUs are still treated as an opaque I.O. device by the operating system. And one of the goals of this talk is to convince you that these are related things. GPUs remain unusable in a lot of application domains because they are treated as an opaque I.O. device by the OS. So a brief outline for the rest of my talk. I'm going to make a case for OS support and what that OS support should look like. I'm going to talk about PTASK, which is a system we built to provide that support, show you some empirical results, touch on related work, and conclude. So to frame the discussion, I want to make a really, really basic point about OS abstractions. So this time-honored tradition of encapsulating low-level interfaces with increasingly abstract layers of software has yielded a situation where the abstractions that programmers program to have more or less a one-to-one -one correspondence with abstractions that are supported at the system call interface. Now, the reason I take the time to make this point, which should be more or less remedial in this audience, is because it is such a stark contrast to what we have in the technology stack for GPUs. The programmer-facing interface for GPUs includes some fairly powerful programming frameworks like CUDA, OpenCL, and DirectX. But at the kernel level, we have arguably one OS level abstraction. It's not even really an abstraction, right? Like IO control system call lets you send vendor specific codes from user mode to a driver. This is not an abstraction. So you might reasonably ask, if the programmer is working with great abstractions, wh why is it a problem that we don't have a broader form of OS support? And so the argument that I'm going to make during this talk is that there are really three problems that result from this. First, because the GPU is opaque to the OS, there is no kernel-facing API, making it very difficult for the OS to use the GPU directly for its own work. <coughs> Second, because the GPU is opaque, the OS cannot play the resource management role that we traditionally expect of it when it manages other hardware. And finally, an argument that's going to take a few slides to develop is that the situation results in fundamentally poor composability for applications that need to use the GPU to offload only portions of the work they're doing. So let's consider resource management first. And I want to convince you that this is a very real problem, the lack of uh, OS level resource management. And I'm going to attempt to prove this to you by showing you two performance pathologies. The first is a situation where CPU bound processes and GPU bound processes can interfere with each other. I'm showing you the throughput of a simple CUDA GPU benchmark. All it does is a uh, simple image convolution in a tight loop. And I'm comparing its throughput when there's minimal CPU load in the system and when the system is heavily loaded on the CPU. And so I synthesize a heavy CPU load simply by incrementing counters in a tight loop. Now, intuitively, these are processes that are 
working with nearly disjoint resources, right, a GPU and a CPU, and yet the presence of a high CPU load cuts the throughput of the GPU work in half. And the bottom line problem here is that the GPU scheduler and the CPU scheduler are not integrated and cannot be because the GPU scheduler is in, in, uh, implemented in vendor-specific proprietary driver code, and the CPU scheduler provides no interface for the GPU to communicate with it. Now, there's a similar problem where GPU-bound processes can harm the performance of CPU processes. And to demonstrate this, what I did was in, uh, instrument Windows 7 to measure the rate at which it can deliver mouse move events from the kernel to user programs. And I compared that mouse frequency rate when there's no GPU work in the system against the rate when there is a single CUDA benchmark running in the system. Now again, the only need for the GPU that uh, is required in mouse move is updating the cursor, and yet a, sim a, a very simple CUDA benchmark doing image processing is able to drop the mouse event frequency by a factor of six, and if, you, you know, if you're there looking at the machine, it appears hung. It's uh, totally untenable. Now this particular pathology it would, to, you know, to, to give you a rigorous understanding it would take more time than I really have in this talk, but I encourage you, if you're interested, please talk to me afterwards. It's very interesting. But the bottom line is that the OS lacks an effective way to prioritize its own work updating the screen. So, the third point that I made earlier on is I was going to talk about composability, and to develop this argument, I'm going to use an application that got me interested in this area in the first place, and that's gestural interface. So, if you're unfamiliar with gestural interfaces, you wave your hands at the computer and hope it does something reasonable in response. And the implementations that have interested me are ones based on cameras and, and computer vision. And any system like this can be decomposed into four basic blocks. You need something that lets you capture image data from a camera. You need something that allows you to transform that image data from the perspective of the cameras to the perspective of the user or the screen. Typically, these things are implemented with uh, commodity hardware, so the cameras tend to be noisy, and good noise filtering is critical. And finally, you need a component that can look at this normalized, pre-processed image data, find hands, detect gestures, and so on. Now, what's interesting to me about this workload is that it has high data rates, needs good response time, but it also features a lot of data parallel work, making it you know, a really good fit, ideally, for the GPU. So here's what I would have liked to do to build this system. I'd like to take the block decomposition that I showed you in the previous slide and write a program for each one. Connect them up with POSIX pipes and we're good to go, right? So why is this desirable? Well, it's modular, it's easy to change, easy to reuse components, lets us utilize the heterogeneous resources in our system, and lets us leverage OS-provided tools to simplify development. Now, as you might guess, I'm about to show you some serious problems this implementation. But to help you understand what those problems are, I do need to give you some background about the GPU execution model. So GPUs, with a few exceptions, cannot run OS code because they lack the architectural features needed to support an OS, things like timers and interrupts. They have a different ISA. And because GPUs typically have a disjoint memory space, these two factors yield a situation where host code has to actually orchestrate execution on GPUs. Typically there will be a user mode application that implements explicit copying of memory from, uh, memory from CPU memory into GPU memory, results back, sending commands to, uh, to start GPU code executing on the GPU. Now with this execution model in mind, let's see how data moves through the system under the naive design that I proposed earlier. So what I'm showing you here is across the top, the four user mode programs that we'd like to connect with pipes some hardware on the bottom, a GPU and a camera. And in the middle, in the, in the kernel area, I'm showing the camera driver, GPU driver, and so on. And these little nuts are supposed to be pipes. So when a frame of image data moves through the system, the first thing that happens is it will be buffered in the kernel, in the camera driver. And when the capture program attempts to read it, it will make a system call, which will copy that data across the user kernel boundary into the address space of the capture program. Now, recall that Capture is going to communicate with the XForm component by writing into a pipe. So the first thing this component is going to do is write that data back across the user kernel boundary, at which point it will be read back into the address space and copied yet again in the XForm component. Now, here's where things get really egregious. Recall that we want to use the XForm component. We want to execute that on the GPU, 
which requires that we get that data into the disjoint memory that is implemented by the GPU. This involves copying the buffer into the GPU driver and a subsequent DMA transfer, which gives us yet another copy of this data in GPU memory. Now, of course, we want the results back. You can all see where this is going, right? You don't need me to painstakingly go through every step. The bottom line is that we wind up with this, uh, this tennis match of, uh, of large data moving very frequently back and forth across the user kernel boundary and migrating needlessly through hardware. Now, this is a serious drag, uh, not just because it's wasteful and because it, uh, you know, wastes power, but because it's totally avoidable if you have the right abstraction. So hopefully, I've convinced you at least somewhat that GPUs really need better OS level support. And what I propose is that we need GPU analogs for things that we expect from processes, things like the process creation API, uh, inter-process communication, scheduling hints, and so on. And ideally, we can choose these abstractions in a way that lets the OS perform the resource management role we expect from it, lets the OS use the GPU if it wants, and can help with data migration and optimization of, uh, of data movement. So with that, I'm going to move on and start talking about PTASC, which is a system we've built that uh, we believe does just that. So PTASC proposes essentially five new OS level abstractions. The first is a PTASC, short for parallel task. You can think of it as a, analogous to a process for a GPU invocation. It has priorities so that it uh, can, so the OS can enforce fairness for it. And it has a list of canonical input and output resources that you can think of as being very much like standard in and standard out in posit. Now PTASCs expose their inputs and outputs through ports which are essentially data, source, data sources and sinks. And you can connect these all with channels. Again, very much analogous to pipes, but which allow us to specialize implementations to take advantage of the topology of the machine and take advantage of where buffers are, are uh, currently most up to date. Now, what the programmer does with these abstractions is compose a directed acyclic graph called a PTAS graph. And the system executes by moving data blocks, which are discret discretized chunks of stream data, uh, going, th going through channels and nodes, okay? So the, the real high level point here is that we are explicitly managing OS objects here so the OS can play a resource management role and we've changed the, the situation from one where the programmer has to write both data movement code and algorithm code to one where the programmer only specifies where data needs to go and not how or when it needs to get there, letting the system uh, do a better job ideally than the programmer might have. So let's look at how we can use these abstractions to solve our gestural interface problem. You'll recall that I asserted that capturing image data from a camera and detecting hands in a cloud are essentially sequential. So we'll leave them as processes. But the geometric transformation and noise filtering are data parallel, so we'll recast them as p-tasks. We'll expose their inputs and outputs using ports, connect the whole business up with channels, and lo and behold, the aggregate of all these p-tasks, ports, and channels is a graph. Now, the system will be driven by the pushing of data blocks into the channels and the pulling of data blocks out the other end. You might reasonably ask, why is this regime preferable <laughs> to the previous? And there are a couple reasons. First, we can optimize data movement by specializing channel implementations. For instance, the channel connecting the capture and the XForm components can map the same physical buffer into the address space of both the capture address uh, program and the PTASC runtime, so we avoid double, double buffering there. The channel that connects the X form and filter can notice that both endpoints are in GPU memory space and completely allied data transfers that were fundamental to the modular design I previously proposed. The other advantage is that we can use the arrival of data at nodes in the graph to trigger the next computation. And the advantage of this is that it eliminates, eliminates the need for a dedicated user mode driver program to orchestrate the computation on the GPU. The runtime handles it all transparently. So I want to say a quick word about PTASC scheduling. So PTASC provides a, a data flow program <coughs> now. And in PTASC, those graphs are scheduled dynamically, which means that PTASCs are queued for dispatch only when their inputs are ready. And the queue is sorted in dynamic priority order. I could go into a lot of detail here about the actual scheduling algorithm, but it's, it's not really the point. The point is that by using these abstractions, we've made it possible to do scheduling where it was not previously possible, and even the most basic scheduling techniques that you learned early on are incredibly effective here because there was nothing going on there before. 
The other great advantage of this is that we can transparently support multiple GPUs. With current GPU runtimes, if there's more than one there, the programmer would have to rewrite his program to take advantage of more than one GPU. With PTASK, you get the same, the same, same code without any changes can scale with the addition of more hardware. Okay, so I wanna dig in and give you a little bit of detail about how data blocks give us this abstraction of, of uh, location transparency. And you can think of a data block essentially as a logical buffer, which is backed by potentially many physical buffers. And these physical buffers are created and updated lazily. And we make uh, extensive use of memory mapping when data blocks move across process boundaries so that we can avoid double buffering. The other thing that the data block gives us is a container which we can use to track buffer validity in each memory space. For example, if, uh, if, a, if a GPU buffer is written during a GPU invocation, we can invalidate the copy of the buffer that is in the main memory space, and the next time that data block is referenced from host code, that will trigger a copy back from, from the GPU. Finally, data blocks give us some flags for basic access control and help us encapsulate architectural features of the GPU like uh, uh, constant memory and shared memory and so on. So we're moving now into the data block action zone where uh, I'll show you with my amazing animation skills just how the data block works in, in a real situation. And we're looking at a subset of this uh, gestural interface graph. This time when the capture program finds out that there's new image data available from the camera, rather than reading it across the user kernel boundary with a, with a system call, it calls into the PTASK API and creates a new data block that encapsulates that physical buffer. And you'll see I've created this data block and noted and put red numbers that indicate it's valid, modifiable, has read-write permissions, and so on. Now, the next step is for the capture program to push that data block into the channel that is connected to the XForm component. And a side effect of this is that the runtime will notice that all of the inputs for the XForm are now ready, all, all one of them, right? So, this means that, PTA that the XForm PTAS can be queued for dispatch. Unfortunately, you'll notice if you look closely that there is no physical memory buffer backing this data block yet, which will make it impossible to dispatch to the XForm uh, invocation. So the PTAS runtime notices this, copies the data from main memory into the GPU memory, and then invokes the XForm. If the XForm uh, invocation modifies the data in the GPU memory, the uh, the main memory copy will be invalidated. And I'll put a, put a zero there to show that. And essentially what this means is that the copy of the image data that is in GPU memory is the most up-to-date version. And all the data block is giving us is a way to make sure we always know where the most recent data is. And we always have a, a method for materializing the most recent view of the data in the place where we need it on demand. Okay, so I wanna step aside for a moment and make a really explicit point because People always ask me this question afterwards, so I'm heading this off. What does this entail for existing technology stacks? What we're really proposing here is that there is support at the system call interface for these abstractions and that the programmer can work directly with them, but we also envision that existing and future GPU runtimes can be built on top of these abstractions. So now you know. All right, so I wanna move on and uh, share briefly some uh, experimental results from prototypes we've built. We've evaluated these ideas in two contexts, uh, in Windows and Linux. In Windows, we built the full PTASK API as a, and implemented it as a stacked user mode and kernel mode driver. We have to do this because, as I said previously, there's no kernel-facing interface to control the GPUs, so we have to partition the work such that the kernel mode component is responsible for memory mapping, signaling, and makes up calls into the user mode component, which can then call into existing GPU APIs to control the GPU. And we implement system calls not by modifying the system calls directly, but we map them directly to, we map them to uh, device I.O. control calls. Now our Linux implementation is considerably less mature. We have not implemented the full PTASK API there, but rather we have changed the OS scheduling to take into account GPU usage. And what essentially this amounts to is modification of the task struct to give us some, uh, some way to record how much GPU budget has been consumed and we can block GPU invocations for, for processes that have used too much. And again, let me emphasize, this is not a talk about how great our particular scheduling algorithm is, it's a talk about how you can make it possible to do the scheduling. Now, let's look at what we were able to do for the gestural interface. 
Yeah. In order to evaluate what each of the different features of PTASK was giving us, in terms of performance, we had to build a lot of different implementations of the same gestural interface. I do like writing that code, so it's okay. But we built, uh, we built four different versions. One we'll call pipes, and it's exactly the design that I proposed early on, four different processes communicating through pipes. The second, which I'll call modular, has the same code modular design, but does not communicate through IPC. It's all the components in the same address space. So IPC overhead is eliminated, but the uh, data transfer overheads are not. We have a hand-coded version that is hand-optimized to have optimal data movement, and then there's a PTASK version, which is implemented using the PTASK API. We evaluate the system both driven by the cameras, which we call real-time, and then we run it in an unconstrained mode where we play data back from memory to see what the maximum possible throughput is. So <coughs> at last, some numbers. I'm showing you a few important metrics for a gestural interface. The runtime is the wall clock time that it takes the unconstrained version to process a thousand, time, thousand frames from memory. This is essentially a metric of maximum throughput. And I'm showing user and system util, uh, uh, utilization for the configuration when it's running actually driven by cameras. So in a deployed version, these are the metrics we would care about. How much are we expending of our system resources to process user input? High level takeaways here are that compared to the hand code version, PTASK is able to deliver 11.6% higher throughput while lowering the CPU utilization. And it's able to do this because once the PTASK graph is assembled, we no longer need this dedicated user mode driver program. And we can eliminate some unnecessary computation there. Compared to our pipes based design, we are able to drop the CPU utilization by almost a factor of three while raising the throughput by 16 times. Additionally, because this eliminates a lot of double buffering, PTASK eliminates double buffering over pipes, we reduce the memory footprint by about 45%. So this is what you want for gestural interfaces. Now, I started this talk by decrying the woeful state of resource management for GPUs. So let me try to convince you that PTASK actually can help with uh, <coughs> fairness and performance isolation. And what I'm showing you here to demonstrate this is the concurrent execution of four separate PTASK graphs, each with 36 nodes, matrix multiplies connected together, and each graph is assigned uniform priority, PTASK priority ranging from two through eight. And we, care, we, uh, we measure the throughput of each when we use a simple FIFO scheduling algorithm against the basic age priority algorithm that PTASK uses. FIFO is a reasonable baseline in this case because that's what most GPU drivers implement. And the high level takeaway here is that PTASK actually makes it possible to give throughput that is proportional to priority, which is exactly what you want, right? Finally, I want to give you a little bit of a taste of what we can do for multi-GPU scheduling with a, a little bit of a additional logic in the scheduler to track where, which GPU uh, buffers are most recently updated on. It's possible to have a really good benefit from locality and transparently get scaling simply by adding more CPUs and more GPUs, sorry. Um, which you can see in this top bar. <laughs> okay, finally, I want to touch on our, our Linux evaluation. And to evaluate our changes to Linux, we modified NCFS, which is a fuse-based encrypted file system, to offload the AES computation to a GPU. And then we drive NCFS with a very simple read-write benchmark, sequential reads and writes to a 200 megabyte file, and we see what the presence of contention in the system from other users of the GPU does to throughput. Simple uh, competing CUDA benchmark. Now, the first and perhaps most important thing here to note is that by offloading the AES encryption to the GPU, we can get some appreciable performance benefits. And we consider this to be an important validation of the idea that you really do want the OS to be able to use the GPU directly for offloading its own work. However, as soon as, with, with the existing uh, abstractions we have for GPUs, as soon as you have contention for the GPU in the system, a single process contending for the GPU is able to not only obliterate those performance gains, but make the system dramatically worse. And this is despite the fact that we're running NCFS with a nice minus 20, the highest priority, and these contending processes at nice plus 19. And this is a horrible priority inversion. And it gets only worse and worse as you add more contention. The upside is that with the simple GPU accounting scheme we've added to the OS scheduler, we're able to <laughs> almost completely restore the performance 
in the presence of contention. All right, so I want to touch very briefly on related work because um, there's quite a bit of it. So recently there's been a lot of interest in OS support for heterogeneous platforms, things like Helios, Barrelfish, Offcodes. And concurrent with our own work, other people have noticed these uh, GPU scheduling pathologies, Time Graph and Pegasus are systems that propose what we consider to be very different methods for enforcing some fairness and isolation in GPU scheduling. Of course, there's a lot, a lot of work in graph-based programming models and task-based execution models. So in conclusion, I'd like to reiterate that some kind of OS abstractions for GPUs are going to be critical if we're going to enable fair management and fair access to the GPU, and if we're going to allow the OS to use the GPU for its own computation. In our experience from developing the PTASK API, we found that the data flow abstraction is an exceptionally good fit because it lets the system manage data movement as well as it can. And the performance benefits that we have experienced and found in our prototype are really uh, compelling. So with that, I'll take your questions. I'm Jun Gi Kim from KAIST, and I'm working on the project about after um, package shader. So I think oh. you may heard about it. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Um, so uh, my question is, uh, what is the uh, most optimal granularity for invalidating uh, some portion of data blocks? So uh, I think it's very uh, uh, our application-specific problem. So uh, some packets are updated or, and some other packets are not updated. So we want to copy only the updated packets with some repetitive, repetitive execution of GPU kernels. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think I, I want to uh, know what is your thought about that? Is it desirable well, to, to so have? I, I, yeah. I have a lot of thoughts about that. First, the, the, so if I recall correctly, packet shader batches quite a bit, right? So that introduces the problem of granularity where it might not otherwise be present, right? Um, that said, the fact that you're transferring data across the PCI bus kind of means that the fact that you're doing a transfer at all is the lion's share of the overhead, right? PCI transfer latency does not scale linearly with size. So my intuition would be that the optimal granularity would be the whole thing. <laughs> because you can get it done in one transfer at a cost that is not significantly more than attempting to do a smaller transfer. Thank you. Alec Wall in Microsoft. Um, I was wondering, uh, how much of these abstractions are really specific to, uh, to GPUs as opposed to uh, just uh, Great question. sort of specific hardware accelerators in general? I mean, if you look at mobile devices today, they've got, you know, uh, maybe DSPs, they have, you know, AES acceleration hardware, uh, H.264 decoders, those kinds of things. Yeah, no, I, you're preaching to the choir. If I could get away with global search and replace on GPU and just put accelerator, I would do it. Because what this system is really about is support for heterogeneity. In, and I think as we demand more and more from our systems in order to continue scaling, we're going to have to specialize more and more. So systems are going to look like constellations of very specialized accelerators. And that's what PTASK is targeted at. You can't really posit a world where every little specialized accelerator can run the OS. So you need some kind of OS runtime support. And were, were there particular aspects of, of, of PTASK that were, were targeted at how GPUs work as opposed to these other accelerators? Or do you think it's pretty generic? I think the basic idea is, so the, so the data block providing this abstraction of location <coughs> transparency across disjoint memory spaces is generic, and that's going to be the fundamental thing. Um, there, are f there are a lot of things that I'll perhaps unkindly to myself call warts in the design of the data block that are a little bit G GPU architecture specific, things that help us uh, deal with specialized memory support on the GPU that you would not expect to be there in any other kind of architecture. 